The trouble with computers is that they're usually right. There's nothing like them for making mere humans feel inadequate. This one can add or subtract about 300,000 large numbers a second. It could sort several hundred thousand customers from, say, alphabetical order like this to numerical order like this in a few hours. It prints out accounts by the thousand every month, checks its own mistakes and even those of its engineers. Very impressive, very humiliating. And just a minute, George. If you think this has nothing to do with you because you drive a lorry, you're wrong. Keep watching. And you, dear. And you. You know, you can be too impressed by a computer. If you think that it's a sort of electronic monster which has enslaved a lot of people in the accounts office and will eventually take over all your lives, it's about time we cut it down to size. A computer's great assets are speed and accuracy. But in essence, it's only made up from principles like this and this and this. It does precisely what it's told, and nothing else. It cannot think for itself. Its thinking and its orders come from the programmers. Ah, now that's where you come in, George. And you, Elsie. And you, and, well, most of you. But let's start at the beginning. Take a large, well-known British company that have a computer in their accounts centre in Manchester. Out of 39 order offices throughout the country, Let's take just one. This one will do. Yes, that's pretty typical. Handles about 3,000 orders a week for gases and equipment in this case. But it's a similar story, whatever you're making and selling. Now take a customer who wants to place an order and play it from here. The clerk who takes the order starts the ball rolling by entering on a five-part order form a short version of the customer's name and address, his requirements, and the data. Full details of the customer's account come from his Adrema plate. The Adrema information goes through all five copies, but the first two take no further part in our story. Keep your eye on number three, you'll see a lot more of it. Copies three, four, and five go to the transport section for the delivery to be organized for the next morning. The orders are compiled into economical lorry loads and the required cylinders of gas filled. Some of them have to have their exact quantities marked. The pink number three will go back to the order office. The driver will take numbers four and five with him for each delivery. Bright and early next morning, the driver picks up his paperwork, the route he has to take, the drops he has to make, and the fourth and fifth copies of the order form for each delivery. The load has been made up overnight, so off it goes to the customers. Deliveries are made on a full for empty basis. So the first thing the driver must check is that he picks up one empty cylinder for each one he delivers. He enters this fact on the forms, 
gets a receipt, leaves number five with the customer, and takes number four back with him. He goes through this procedure at every drop until his load is gone. Back at his base, he hands in all his number fours, which are checked, and then come back to roost at the order office where they were hatched in the first place. The final job in the order office is to transfer the extra information that the driver has obtained, number of return cylinders and exact gas quantities, from his number four onto the pink number three. This is the computer and pricing copy. Now a complete record of the whole order and delivery. This is what goes to Manchester. In plastic bags, naturally. Knowing Manchester, do you wonder? To this company's accounting centre flows the paperwork from all over the country. 22,000 transactions a day from 40 branches. Their customers spread from the Channel Islands to the Orkneys. On arrival at Manchester, there is in some cases one more clerical job to be done on the computer copy. The entering of the price which the individual customer will be charged for his gas. In other cases, this will be done automatically by the computer. The number threes are now collected into batches from the same branch on the same date and all the information is complete. The number three has now come to the end of the road. The information it contains is being transferred to punched tape for the computer to absorb. Now just let's remind ourselves how many people have contributed to this information. One, two, three, four, five, Six, seven. Seven people, whose job has nothing to do with computers on the face of it, have compiled this information, most of which the computer must take on trust. Let's see what the computer is interested in. Not, for a start, in the customer's name and address, or the names of the gases he received. His geographical location, trade classification and local representative are already known to the computer, so these are no longer required. This code concerns the pricing of the customer's gas. It's required only by the pricing clerk. What the computer is interested in is the customer's account number, which defines that customer absolutely. The computer has a way of checking that the number is authentic. The gases themselves are shown by codes. The number and sizes of cylinders ordered and quoted. The difference between cylinders delivered and cylinders returned. The customer's order number. The exact volume of gas in certain cases. And whether the cylinders were on loan or customer refills the price the customer is charged. Finally, the order form number. So every detail of this transaction has been reduced to numbers, the computer's own language. Now it's converted into a form which the computer can read, punched tape. This is the last human process before the data is given to the computer. Because it's so important, it's done twice the second girl checking the tape produced by the first. To complete the picture, the computer needs to know what cash has been received from customers. It all comes here eventually. Details of all the transactions involving hundreds of thousands of customers are recorded on these magnetic tapes and churned over by the computer every day. In the end, what comes out of it? Well, the computer earns its keep in two ways.
Every month, it churns out 80,000 invoices, computing them from the accumulated data on each customer's account. The computer has made it possible for this company to change from daily invoicing, which is some 300,000 a month, plus statements, to a combined monthly invoice statement. Among many other savings is the impressive one of 40,000 pounds a year on postage alone. The computer's other job is this. These figures, which mean so little to you and me, are vital to those who run any large company. Let's explain by looking at another major industry. Mr. Morgan is an ambitious man. The first mousetrap millionaire, that's his aim. He's always on the lookout for new ways of improving his efficiency. Always asking himself questions. Is he selling in the right places? Should he redeploy his sales force? Should he perhaps increase his staff? What are his competitors turning out? Should he use different production methods, even redesign his product? To answer all these questions, Mr. Morgan must look at the facts, the details of his sales and his customers. Even Mr. Morgan has to use those dreary things, statistics. Any big company has to ask itself a lot of questions, and many of them are the same as Mr. Morgan's. Where's the product being sold, and to whom? Where can sales be increased? And where are they already so high that the field staff need help? Where do they need new plant, new branches? Which products are selling best? What's the average price achieved? Does it vary from area to area? If so, why? To answer questions like these, the management must have up-to-date statistics. And it's the computer which supplies them. What customers live where? What industries buy what and how much? Which sales are falling, which are rising? All these are facts which any management must have at their fingertips if they're to keep their company flourishing, expanding and increasing its efficiency to everyone's benefit. But remember, however fancily the computer dresses them up, these are only those very facts that you supply, George. And you, Elsie. And all of you along that vital chain from customer to computer. This is how your job fits into this modern way of running a modern company. Let's see how important it is. What happens if some of the information presented to the computer is wrong? Look at this, for instance. Is that 10 cylinders or 16? If the transport section read it as 16, they'll give a free and useless ride to six cylinders. If they read it correctly as 10, the customer is happy for the moment. But what about this girl? At the rate at which she is perforating, five characters a second as a matter of interest, can you blame her for reading it as 16? So 16 goes into the computer. And 16 are charged on the invoice. The customer is naturally annoyed and writes a letter about it. The letter has to be acknowledged and someone has to find out where the mistake occurred and what the true facts are. Before the matter is sorted out, there can be quite a lot of expensive extra work and perhaps unpopular overtime for someone. And all from a second of carelessness in writing down one figure. Errors at any level can also distort those all-important statistics. Here it has more of a long-term effect. It would be silly to claim that one mistake on a form can lead to a factory being built in the wrong place. Or the wrong deployment of staff. But the principle is there. If the statistics which come from the computer contain errors, 
We can hardly expect the people who use them to come up with the right decisions on problems which affect everybody in the company. It's likely that with many companies, 10% of the details which are going into the computer on a tape like this contain errors. 10%. Quite a thought, isn't it? When you consider all the work that's gone into it. And don't forget that some errors are bound to be spotted before they get this far. It could be a driver's error. An indistinct Adrema impression. Or an order clerk's error. Of those that do get this far, most are rejected by the computer itself. This is the computer grumbling. A list of items which is being thrown back at us, inviting us to think again. Let's look at a few. S44, that means wrong date. Probably an error by the batching clerk. R51, impossible part number. R56, impossible volume of gas. R57, impossible price. Just look at this list of rejection codes. There are 107 of them. If the computer is so good at spotting errors, why worry? But just think what it costs. There's computer time at 30 pounds an hour, finding the errors and printing them out with reasons for rejection. In this case, a whole department is employed entirely on chasing up each error, finding the right facts, and preparing them for resubmission to the computer. And then they may have to wait, because the computer is doing something else. This causes delays in sending out accounts, and costs money. Every error costs money. Is this all your fault, George? Is this what you're costing, Elsie? No, of course it isn't. It's a problem that concerns everyone. Management can do a lot to help. In this company, for instance, electric Adrema machines are being installed, which give a better impression down to the last copy without thumping. And the forms themselves will be redesigned for easier use when the computer eventually handles every account. Branch supervisors, aware of the error problem, have installed their own document checking section to check the paperwork before it goes to the accounts centre. Visits to the accounts centre are organised so that branch staff can see for themselves what happens to their handiwork. And there's a liaison officer whose job is to keep the branches and the accounts centre acquainted with each other's problems. Your contribution to your company is to spend an extra second or two to write clearly, to make sure you've put in all the information. Use Adrema machines carefully and check the result. Remember that girl who's got a perforated? Fill in all details properly and make sure they make sense. An extra five seconds now may save a day later. Add that up between you all. Check that part number. The computer knows them all, so you can't fool it, only waste its time. Remember that the computer is a well-trained slave, not a master. It cannot think for itself. It expects us to stick to the rules. Remember how much money is being spent making corrections and think how everyone could benefit if your company could save it. It's real money we're talking about. <laughs>